Hello, anybody here? Welcome. If there's anybody here, we're going to start in about about five or ten after seven. We're just opening it for people to chat if they feel like it. <clears throat> can you see if there's anyone waiting? All right, or can anyone coming in, Raj? On. Yeah, I don't see any comments yet. Okay. Well, that usually takes a while anyway. Well, the whole point of getting to a bar early is that you can get a drink. The whole point of getting to a Zoom early is that you have to be on Zoom longer. <laughs> I like Zoom. I, I, hate, I, I, hate, I hate Zoom. Why? Uh, because looking at a screen for a long period of time fucks up my neck. Oh, well, that's a, that's a good reason. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, I actually enjoy Zoom. And it seems more stable than, usually it seems better than Skype. I like Skype. I, I, think, I think it's that I like talking to one person at a time. Yeah, well, it's more complicated when you have a lot of people. I mean, next Tuesday, we're going to have the um, Shirley Jackson one. It's going to be eight people reading. And we've never had that. That's the limit you can have is 10 in the thing. So it'll be me and Matt and eight readers. And I don't know how that's going to go. And we experimented and we tried with about six people showed up for the tryout. And it seemed okay. But we won't really know until it happens. You can come in. Yeah, you can let everybody see how beautiful you are. I like this little thing that says, everyone can see and hear you, just in case I forget. And Okay, the, well, that cat has decided she does not want to be seen or heard. Cool. Okay. I just tweeted it again. I'm trying to figure out what height things need to be. You usually you start out, you start coming in around now. I mean, you open a little early. There we go comments oh good see we don't see them yet come in they're a little there's a lag so you can see the comments you just can't comment right, exactly except verbally but the Ooh. comments haven't come in yet oh wait a minute i didn't turn on sorry i didn't turn on the comment thing hello everybody oh matt's here wait that's an old wait, these those were old ones oh hell, hi <laughs> those were matt's old ones from the other day hi uh carol how are you? We, you've got one cat. See, there's Jack. Jack the Jerk's on the couch. Hi, Joseph. I hope Make we get at least one cat. Sounds like there will be door prizes. <laughs> <laughs> if you choose, you can. someone can take home Jack the Jerk. Maybe. I don't know if I'll give him up. God, your new place is so big. It does. It is. I mean, the living room is twice the size of my old one, I think. You gotta come over. You'll come over. I even have well, I don't I I have an air bed. This one won't collapse on you. Poor Ellen once stayed at my place and um it was you, right? With the yeah, it was whatever me. it was a I don't think it was an air bed, but an air mattress or something, and apparently the cats had clawed holes in it and every in the morning it I and mean, very quickly it was flat as a pancake. Oh, Ellen. it was flat at two thirty in the morning, and I was just lying there on on a piece of rubber on the, on the floor. I'm really sorry, but now, I mean, I will check the air bed before people actually use it. And you can, and there's plenty of room in my living room to to lie in it or to put that there. I, the come over sounds like there's less than three thousand miles between. <laughs> well, here, come on over anytime. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just just hop on the bus. Mm -hmm. Be there in four days. I'm sorry. It's I'm really warm. I'm putting on the air fish a little higher. If it makes too much noise, 
It, it's 62 where I am, so. I don't know what it is here, but it feels really warm. It is, hold on. It's 81. Oh, God, and we're going to have thunderstorms tonight. I hope later. Oh, they're not, the thunderstorms won't be coming until we're finished, I think. But um, it's still 81 degrees. No wonder I'm hot. And also my lamp, my lights, on, but I need that. Actually, yeah, yeah. Well, where I'm I am in Florida, so there are fires. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. This has been the coldest year that I've that I've I've lived in California for fifty years, and this is the coldest year we've ever had. It's really? just, yeah, it's been like I mean, gale force winds. Mm -hmm. Usually happen in March and April, and then they calm down. But it's like it's so windy every single day. Wow. That I was the other day. I was wearing a t-shirt and a down jacket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am envying. Yeah. It has been. It, this has not been as much of a record-breaking heat summer, but it has definitely been hot, and it is still hot. So I went out this morning. I was like, finally, it's a bit cool, and by. <laughs> Around 11, it was like, no, it's not actually a bit cool. It is well, yesterday, cool. yesterday, the weather here was gorgeous. I mean, if you stayed in the shade, it was breezy. And today I went out the same time, and it was not breezy. It was too warm. Um, so it totally varies. Mm -hmm. Oh, so how is everybody? How are you, Carol? How's everything going? Mm. So Matt's not here tonight. He's taking an evening off with his family. Well, it's Yom Kippur. You shouldn't be here either. I don't do that. <laughs> I haven't fasted in like 50 years or more. And I was really bad at doing it when I did it. <laughs> I hated it. Oh, I didn't know you had a cold. Carol, can you hear me? Let's see what she's doing. Let's see if she responds. So, Raj, you were on vacation. Where were you again? Curacao. Uh huh. In the Caribbean, it's a former Dutch colony. It was it was really nice, beautiful. Um, I mean, I was lucky to be able to go, <clears throat> but it was the first vacation in a while, so it was nice to just get away. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been more than fifty miles from my house in almost two years. Yeah. No, I started traveling. I visited my mom um, for her birthday mid June. In Florida, my sister and I went down. And that was okay. People were mad at the airport, you know, which was I which I was concerned about. How old is your mom now? Ninety four. Wow. Yeah, and she got breaks with COVID, but she's okay. She got the uh monoclonal antibodies, I think. And like within a day she was back to normal. And she's playing wow. Mahjong. Her friends and she are playing Mahjong. But it's funny. She won $5. And she told me that at least one of the people is like a beginner. And it's like she's terrible. It's like she never played before. Not my mom, but this other woman. So they may try to get new players. You know, it's like. It's not up to huh? It's not up to stuff the other person. No. I mean, I've my other. They hadn't played for a year. You know, they were maybe not that long. Maybe six. They were playing. And then I think someone in their group got COVID, so they stopped. And um, I don't think they played for several months. But she also made friends on um, Sunday lunch at the at a. Okay, you're echoing again. No, I am. I don't know what to do about it. Should I? You want to knock me out again for a second, Raj? Knock me out and bring me back in.
Knock out. Back in. Knock out. Back in. Okay. Um. How is it now? Is it better? Um. For the time being. It's just still echoing. It is. Oh. All right. Let me see if I can get my. Are you sitting <laughs> like? Okay, I'm, not, no. I'm not doing anything differently than I always do, but let me. I think I'm that. echoing now. Am I echoing? No. Yes. Wait. Speak. Say a few things. Um. Am I echoing? Okay. That time. It. That time. No. It wasn't. So I think um, it's. Carol, it's I. You. I realize that's why I'm wondering if I need to use headphones. I have never needed them before. I've never gotten fe um, echoing. Maybe it's me because I'm I'm the new, the new thing here. So maybe I'll, I'll try headphones. I have them right here. It's fine. Okay, but that would be what I'm echoing. Well, if if it could be because if your sound is coming through my microphone, that might be the thing. Okay, well, we'll try that. In the meantime, I'll try to untangle my mic. <laughs> somebody, somebody in the comments said the other three of us should mute and see if that makes any difference. Okay. So I will mute. Okay. Raj, mute for a second. Okay. Okay. Am I, I'm not echoing now. So what does that mean? <laughs> You're all muted and I'm fine. So come back I, on. So what does that I don't, mean? I don't know what that means. Carol, what does that mean? <laughs> well, yeah, so if, if, if it was me, then this should fix it because... Oh, okay. Let me talk. You hello, won't be coming. Uh, hello, hello. Is everything fine? Oh. It sounds okay. So maybe it was yes. me. I apologize. All right. If it's me again, I'll. I'm not going to talk that much. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, forget it. I think it's okay. Well, and for most of the evening, you one guys person will be reading, and the everybody else will be silent. Right. So that'll right. work. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, whoever suggested. Well, who? I guess Raj, you suggested that it was you. <laughs> Uh, I want to start in like five minutes or let's wait just a few more minutes. Thank you, Carol. Good. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Good. Mara, you can unmute yourself. Unless I was the problem. So <laughs> no, no, we realized Raj was the okay. problem. <clears throat> I'm always the problem. <laughs> he was a new guy in town. Lisanne, I don't think I've seen you here before. I'm really glad to see you. This is our last um, virtual one, we hope. We're planning on going back to the bar next month. And we're not going to, we haven't figured out if we, how to do live streaming. So we're probably not, unfortunately. But we'll do the podcast on the website as usual. And I'll take pictures. I don't know who's going to show up next month. I don't know how nervous people are, but we'll just have to see. Okay, I'm going to store it, right? Okay. Welcome, everybody, to Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Usually, I run this. I'm Ellen Datlow, and I usually host with Matt Kressel, who is with his family tonight for um, Yum Kipper. And so Raj Khanna, Rajan Khanna is taking over both co-hosting and tech duty. And if something goes wrong with the tech, I am useless. So we will hope that nothing goes wrong with the tech or that Raj can fix it. Anyway, um, Matt usually gives a history of the whole thing, and I'm not doing that. You can go online. It's on the KGB website to figure out the whole history of what we do and how long we've been doing it. Um, we've been now doing this virtually for a, at least a year. And uh, as I said, next month, October, we are hoping to go back to in person. And what we're going to do next month, October 20th, we have Mike DeLuca and Daryl Gregory in person. Um, November 17th, we have Robert Reddick and C.S.E. Cooney in person. And December 15th, we have David Leo Rice and N.K. Jemison in person. And by the way, I just want to say Nora has been named one of the 100 most influential people of 2021 by Time Magazine today. So that's really cool for her. Um, anyway, our first reader tonight 
Oh, wait. I guess I, I realize, yes. Okay. So support the KGB's reading series. Um, even though we're not there in person, uh, Matt and I donate a, a little bit of money and um, basically what we would pay for drinks. We usually get free drinks. and We donate that back to the bar so, you know, they can can survive though they have survived during this whole pandemic and uh if you want i think that there, there it is there's a banner on the bottom telling you how you can support the bar or is that us i guess that's us not the bar i mean also you can support oh. us yes no there's okay there's the bar <laughs> But you can support us because we uh, give a, a stipend to the writers. And when we're in person, we take them to dinner and uh, afterward. So Wait, we don't get dinner? I'm afraid not. No, we don't. You'll yeah. have to imagine the dinner. And we have a new place. Actually, our place changed. It's same hands, different. Hopefully not too much of a different menu. And hopefully it'll be open by next month. We'll find out. Um, <clears throat> anyway... Our first reader tonight is Mari Ness, who has published short fiction and poetry in Tor.com, Clark's World, Uncanny, Lightspeed, Nightmare, Fireside Apex, Diabolical Plots, Strange Horizons, and Daily Science Fiction. Her poetry novella, Through Immortal of Shadows, Singing, is available from Papaveria Press, and an essay collection, Resistance and Transformation on Fairy Tales, from Aqueduct Press. Very good. You have those with you. She lives in Central Florida under the direct supervision of two magnificent cats who I guess are locked out and will not make an appearance. So, they have an open door. <laughs> so please welcome Mariness. Hi. Uh, the cats may show up. The door is open. Uh, one of them has been pacing back and forth. So we'll see. She's very beautiful. So it's possibly she just doesn't want to overwhelm everybody in the audience with just how beautiful she is possible. Anyway, um, I wasn't entirely sure what to read tonight, but I thought, oh, monster sounds like a bit of fun. Uh, so I'm actually going to be reading two things. One is a uh, short, very short story that will be appearing in my upcoming chapbook collection, uh, Dancing in Silver Lands, which is coming out in November from Neon Hemlock Press. And then I'm going to read what I'm hoping will be a fun little um, dinosaur poem. So uh kind of on, also on the theme of my monsters as dinosaurs. So first one is Memories of Monsters. I could have stayed. Instead, I left with the knight. He didn't have a castle, the knight, nor much of anything beyond his armor, his sword, and two horses. One to carry him, the other to carry a few blankets and food and water skins, as well as embroidered tunics for special occasions. We shifted the bags on that horse so I could find a perch. However uncomfortable, it was easier on the horses and trying to ride double. Eventually, we bought a third horse, but that was eventually, well after I'd made my choice, well after several hungry nights and filthy inns. At times like those, it was hard not to think of the monster, hidden in his castle of stone and silk, of his venison and pies, on nights when we had only stale bread, of his rich wines when we had only weak ale, of his hot fires and thick blankets. I even found myself talking of him to the maidens we met, of his rough voice and claws, of the way I sometimes still felt every touch from him on my skin, on my bones, of the brambles and roses and forests that hid his castle so well that I could not find it again if I tried. I did not want to try, or so I told myself. Easy to believe when my knight covered me with muscled arms, or when I remembered those other arms tinged with sharp claws, of the words he hissed at me. Easy to believe when I could lose myself in story and song. But even then, a word, a moment, and I would think, would remember. My knight learned to touch me gently after moments like these. And I learned to put an edge into the tales I told the maidens, for I could see the gleam in their eyes, the hope that they could conquer these monsters, both those in be beastly and human forms. A hope I could not dismiss, did not want to dismiss. It could happen. It did happen. Monsters can be defeated, can be left, can have their hearts broken or be killed. I knew it. They knew it. What they did not know 
what I hoped they did not know, at least not yet, was the way the touch of monsters can linger in your bones, even after you travel to another tale. So that's one. Uh, and then the other, um, this is a poem called Expecting a Dinosaur, which originally appeared in Uncanny uh, Magazine on issue 23. One, no one ever expects a dinosaur. Two, especially not on a small town street, pounding the pavement with deadly clawed feet. Three, from beneath one of those feet, painful groans, those nearby shrieked, but then stifled their moans. They knew what to do. They pulled out cell phones. Four, could social media save the day or just catch a dinosaur at play? Five, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, hashtag Dino Attack started to trend. Was it some sort of trick? A hologram? Hashtag Dino Attack started to trend on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Six, the dinosaur ignored the upraised bones. It hungered for blood, for freshly caught meat, for the rich marrow found in human bones. It stalked down the street. Some tried to retreat, their shrieks filling the air with dreadful tones. Others tried to think of a clever tweet. Seven. Bright, so bright, the afternoon sun. Large, so large, each dinosaur track. Sweet, so sweet, all the live action. Simple, so simple, this attack. Swift, so swift, this dinosaur run. A pounce, a crack. Call 911! Eight. <laughs> Really, who wants to make that sort of call? I saw dinos. They're on Twitter. Goodbye. I, at best, it's blamed on too much alcohol. Really, who wants to make that sort of call? Could get you arrested or worse, don't try. Well, unless you're in a dinosaur brawl. Really, who wants to make that sort of call? I saw dinos there on Twitter. Goodbye. After that, no one could really ignore the phones, the videos, all of the trends or the live feeds from cameras galore recording people fast meeting their ends. So good for ratings. Keep tweeting, you guys. Some even cheered, saying this is hardcore. Weird things like this really kind of godsends. I mean... Ravaging dinosaur. Might be fake, but yeah, we'll live tweet with friends. 10. The sound of sirens in the air, the sound of roaring everywhere, the snapping jaw, the dripping claw, all cameras on the small town square. Oh, God, it's really a dinosaur? The sight of a 30 foot stare, the gaping maw, the sudden awe. Oh, God, it's really a dinosaur. 11. A single lash of the dinosaur tails and oak branches flying into parked cars and window glass falling like heavy hail. The city hall doors were the next to fall, battered down by the dino's bleeding head. Employees emerged in a painful crawl. The monster paced on. The destruction spread, knocking out a cafe's just repaired wall. The music store with its custom guitars, the restaurant with its microbrewed ale, the pizzeria, and far worse, the bars. 12. The internet watch simply mesmerized as the dinosaur continued its rampage, leaving people and buildings pulverized. What, people wondered, would be the next stage? As the dinosaur continued its rampage, crunching on human skin, they agonized. What, people wondered, would be the next stage? Could there be more? Would this be normalized? Crunching on human skin, they agonized. The internet watch simply mesmerized. Could there be more? Would this be normalized, leaving people and buildings pulverized? 13. While this was still under discussion, the dinosaur took off at a run. Someone caught in the ensuing din a glimpse of a logo on its skin in neon green, nearly a beacon. That logo? Well known in the region. Owned by an economic linchpin given quite a nice little tax break. Apparently nothing could be done. So who could really take action? 
beyond letting the dinosaur win. After all, with well-paid jobs at stake, apparently nothing could be done. 14. The lawsuits came swiftly after all this against the police, the lab, and the town. Too many for the courts to just dismiss. A bloody and brutal legal showdown. Courts studied the pictures from Instagram and read hundreds of detailed lab reports. Even took a look at the skiogram. Not something covered in classes on torts. The courts concluded the town was to blame for not saving itself from the attack. The lab strongly concurred with the court's claim. The town should have prepared, should have fought back. But the town said they could not have done more. No one ever expects a dinosaur. And um, that's the poem. So don't forget, it'll be a little bit people are, will react. That was wonderful. Thank you. So, okay. Um, if you want, you know you have time to read something else. If oh, I do. Okay. 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, in that case, um, I think I can read another uh, short story from the upcoming uh, chat book. Okay. Uh, and let me just uh, has it? Been, I mean, it's not been published yet, or it has. It is being published in. Uh, no, no, the stories have been published. The story, the stories I'm reading in this it uh, here right now have all been published either in daily science okay, fiction good. or in another okay. location. Okay. Uh, I'm not reading from the original stories that are in the chap chapbook. Okay. For those you've got to get the chapbook for. Right. Okay. Read one more. If you the fox like. bride. He carried his, the squirming animal to his no. There. He had to remember that now. There. Bedroom, struggling to avoid her sharp teeth. The oversized ring he had given her glimmered on her left front leg. She had spent most of the evening biting and licking at it when she had not been growling. He had ordered the musicians to play louder, to cover up the noise, but the growl still lingered in his ears. When he reached the room, he secured her chain to one end of the bed and sat gingerly at the other end. The waxing moonlight flooded the bed, giving a silver sheen to her red and snowy fur. When you are a woman, I can remove the chain, he told the fox. The fox bark barked. I swear it, he said. A snarl. Change for me, he begged. The fox put a paw up to the change. I swear it, he said again, extending his hand. The fox leapt forward and bit deeply into his finger. He cried out, trying to pull his hand away, but the teeth of the fox were sharp and strong. Blood spattered the silk and satin coverings before he could pull back his hand, and the tongue of the fox was covered in blood. Damn you, said the prince. I didn't want this either. But for his father's sake, he spent the night on the edge of the bed, just outside the range of the chain. He did not sleep much. If the fox slept, he did not know. Give it three nights, said the music magician. She will change. Give it three nights, said the seer. She will change. Give it three nights, said the king. Or I very much fear your neck will change. She bit me, the prince said. An excellent preparation for marriage, said the king. Consider her beauty, said the magician. Consider her passion, said the seer. Consider your life, said the king. And so the prince returned to his room and considered the red fox on his bed, tied to his room with a silver chain, and considered her beauty, her passion, and his life. In the moonlight, even he, no lover of foxes, had to admit her beauty. His hands still ached with the pain from her passion, and so he considered his life. Would it have been easier, he asked, if I had been the one to find you in the woods to bring you here to be my bride? The fox, watching the moon, did not answer. I would have had you remain a fox, he told her. The fox did not answer that either, and that night he slept on the cold marble floor, huddled against the wall. 
It has not been three nights, said the magician. It has not been three nights, said the seer. You are a prince, said the king. And she is a fox, said the prince. Speak to her, said the magician. Speak to her, said the seer. I have other sons, said the king. And so the prince returned to his room and talked to the fox as the waxing moon rose and cast its light through the windows. He spoke of his life as a prince. He spoke of wandering in the woods. He spoke of tales he had loved. He spoke until the fox curled beneath, into a small ball beneath the moonlight until he could see from her steady breathing that she was fast asleep. And this is the third night, said the magician. The night of change, said the seer. Change her into your bride, said the king. I cannot, said the prince. She is no bride. You know our law, said the king, and his face was cold and stern. The youngest prince must marry a fox to bring their blood into our blood, to bring our blood into their shadows. Each of their sons shall become fine princes, and each of their daughters shall enter the woods. <laughs> Those were women who could be foxes, or foxes that could be women. This fox is only a fox. A bride, said the king. A bride, take her and make her yours, and bring your blood into her blood. She is no Bride, the prince said again. The king's face remained cold and stern. If she is not, the fault is in you. Speak to her, said the seer. It is the third night, said the magician. The third night, said the seer. You are my third son, said the king. And if he wept, the prince did not see it. It is your duty. That was all I was, he told the fox, after she tried to bite his hand again, after he handed her a few pieces of smoked fish. A prince, a child, someone to marry the fox. I never had anything else. I never did anything else. He took a small piece of fish himself. Do you know, I have almost never left this castle. The fox turned her head to the moon. Even you were brought to me. I, I've read the tales, how my great-uncles and great-great-uncles and beyond even that rode deep into the forest, sniffing the air and the moon until they came across shimmering maidens with red-white hair and took them beneath the moon and brought back screeching sons who could not be silenced, who barked at any sight of the moon. Sons who married the princesses of the house. I've read the tales. But they did not let me enter the woods. They brought my uncle his fox bride, and they said they would bring me mine. Fox did not turn her eyes from the moon. If nothing else, the prince said, if you remain a fox, I remain nothing. The fox curled herself into a ball. The prince thought of reaching out his hand, but the pain of her earlier bite still stung, and he found himself weeping instead. It has failed, said the magician. It has failed, said the seer. Your death shall be swift, said the king. You are my son. The prince stood beside, before him, the fox on a chain by his side. Give me one more night, he said. That I can grant, said the king, before turning away. That night, the prince brought to his room meat still dripping with blood, fine bread and sweet cakes and pies, the freshest of fruits and red wine. He sat on the edge of the bed, just beyond where her chain could reach, and tossed tidbits at the red, red fox. She sniffed the food, but did not eat, and turned her eyes to the great window in the full full moon. He bit into the red meat and felt the blood drip through his throat. He opened the window wide as wide. And then he pulled out the tiny key around his neck to unlock the silver collar around her neck and pull her from her silver chain. He buried her his hands in her soft, soft fur and slowly turned the tiny key. The collar fell off with a soft click. The window is open, he whispered, and felt the small teeth sink into his throat. The magician cast spell after spell. The seers saw vision after vision. The king raged on and on. But none of this brought back the prince or the small red fox, and the king's justice went unserved. 
But in the woods, some later said, on the nights of a waxing moon, those who fled the castle wall might catch a glimpse of two small foxes, one with fur of brilliant red and snowy white with a golden band around her paw, and one with fur of rich brown and dusky white with a silver collar firm around his neck. The end. That's great. It really was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to take about a five minute break. Okay. Oh, everyone's frozen. Oh, everyone was frozen for a second. Okay. So, yeah. So you can blank out, take away our picture yeah. and put the. We'll get to this one. <laughs> That's, yeah. good. That's great. Okay, we'll be back in five minutes. Mute us all.
Yeah. Welcome back. And Raj, you're going to introduce Ellen. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, Mari has muted herself. So. Um, yeah. So, everyone, uh, thank you for sticking around. Uh, my name is Raj Matana, and I'm stepping in for Matt Crestle for this week. Um, tonight. And uh, I get to introduce Ellen Plagius, who is the author of three acclaimed middle grade novels. Um, the Green Glass Sea, White Sands, Red Menace, and Out of Left Field, which won the New York Historical Society's Children's History Book Prize. Her adult short fiction, fantasy, and some SF has been translated into a dozen languages and been nominated for or won multiple genre awards. Ellen lives in San Francisco in a small house full of strange and wondrous things, which now I would love to visit. So, um, <laughs> Without further ado, Ellen Clages. Yes, there are strange and wondrous things behind me. Um, so it's been, you know, a pandemic, um, and I have not been writing much new, at least not that's in any kind of publishable form. Um, so I am going to read from Passing Strange, um, which is the most beautiful cover I have ever had on on any work. Um, it is set in, most of it is set in 1940 in San Francisco, but I'm going to read the beginning part, which is set in San Francisco in the present. So, the modern city. One. On the last Monday of her life, Helen Young returned from the doctors and made herself a cup of tea. As she had expected, the news was not good. There was nothing more that could be done. From the windows of her apartment high atop Knob Hill, San Francisco's staggered terraces lay like a child's blocks, stacked higgledy-piggledy, the setting sun turning glass and steel into orange neon, old stone, and stucco walls glowing with a peach patina. The fog coiled through the hills like a white serpent. She set the delicate porcelain cup onto a teak side table and thought about what she needed to accomplish, her final to-do list. Ivy, her companion slash caregiver, had the day off, which made the most important task both simpler and more challenging. She would not have to explain, but she would have to do it all herself. Perhaps she should wait until morning? Helen debated, then picked up her phone. After 75 years, she was the last one standing. This was no time for missteps or procrastination. She tapped the screen and summoned a cab. The day had been warm, as autumn in the city often was, but the fog would chill the evening air. She slipped on a light wool jacket and glanced at the brass-headed cane leaning against the side of the sofa. Would she need it, or would it be an impediment? Even though her hearing was shot and her glasses were as thick as a cartoon's, her legs were still good for an old broad. Hell, her legs were still great. She wrapped a hand around the dragon handle and did a nice buck and wing, then set the tip down under the hardwood and left it where it was. At the apartment store, she stopped. If anything did go wrong... She backtracked to the kitchen and the tiny whiteboard that hung next to the fridge and scribbled an address under Ensure and Tuna. Easy to erase when she came back, easy to find if she didn't. The doorman escorted her to the waiting cab. Chinatown, she said to the driver, Spofford Alley, between Washington and Clay. She heard the cabbie sigh. A trip of less than half a mile was not the fare he'd hoped. That's off the main drag, he said. What's there? Long lost friends, Helen answered, and smiled as if that brought her both joy and sorrow. San Francisco is a city of great density, as much vertical as horizontal, surrounded on four of its five sides by water, houses cheek to jowl, but Chinatown made the rest seem spacious. More than 70,000 people packed into a single square mile. Grand Avenue was a string of gaudy shops and restaurants catering to the tourist trade. The alleys were not as gilded or sanitized. 
as the cab turned into the single cramped block lined with three-story brick buildings on either side. Helen could smell the distinctive blend of spices and dried things, vinegar and garbage. Stop here, she said. Are you sure, lady? This isn't a safe neighborhood, especially after dark. I have never been more certain. All right, suit yourself, he glanced at the meter. That'll be 410. She handed a 20 through the window in the thick plexiglass that separated driver and passenger. Wait here. I should be about 15 minutes. There'll be another one of those for my return trip. Uh, the sign says no stopping, tow away. If the cops come, circle the block. She slid another 20 through. Okay, got it. The cabbie nodded his assent and Helen got out. In the dusk of the early evening, the alley seemed to be made of shadows, the only illumination a few lights in upper story windows across the pavement, laundry hanging from the sills, and an illuminated mirror in the back of a beauty salon two doors down, a closed sign dangling in its dingy window. Number 38 was a shabby building with brickwork painted the color of dried blood. A narrow door and street-level window were covered with thick plywood painted to match. The entrance was a solid, weathered slab without ornamentation, not even a knocker. It bore no signs of recent use. Do you know someone who actually lives here? The cabbie asked from his open window. Not precisely. Helen replied. She removed a ring of keys from her jacket pocket. I inherited the building a long time ago. The vestibule was dark. Helen closed the outer door and took a mag light from the pocket of her trousers. In a hallway darker still, she used another key to unlock a wooden door whose hinges screeched with disuse. A flight of rickety steps led down. An odor of must and damp earth wafted up. She flicked the switch at the top of the stairs, bare bulbs glaring on, and turned off her tiny light. Holding the railing for support, she made her careful way down into the cellar. The floor below was cement. Helen's sensible rubber-soled shoes made no sound. She went through an archway and turned left, then left again. Her progress was slow but steady. It was a maze down here, easy to get disoriented. At one time, most of the buildings on the street had been connected underground, six or seven strung together by invisible passages. The ghost tours run for the tourist claimed that these were all dens of iniquity, opium and white slavery, which might have been true before the 1906 fire, but after speakeasies perhaps, until prohibition was repealed, or just convenient ways to get from one place to another. In those days, the cops needed no excuse for a raid in Chinatown, and the subterranean routes were a matter of survival. Now they were only storerooms. The electric lights ended at the third turn. She took out the mag light again. Its narrow beam caught the edges of shrouded furniture, cardboard boxes, an iron-bound trunk, and more than a few scuttling rats. The LEDs gave everything an eerie blue cast, and she shivered despite herself. One more turn led her into a small room with a dirt floor. Two walls were stone, one brick, all solid. The door she'd come through was the only opening. Helen shone the light onto the brick wall. Its regular expanse was broken only by a wooden rack that held a motley array of dusty teacups and bowls, stacks of chipped plates. A rusty lidded cast iron pot sagged the boards of the middle shelf. She switched the light to her left hand and focused the beam on the pot. She reached behind it and found the small knob hidden by its bulk. She tugged. The knob did not move. With a sigh, she tucked the light under one arm, awkwardly trying to keep it focused. She gave silent thanks for the yoga and dance classes that kept her as flexible as she was. Using both hands, she tugged at the unseen latch. It finally slid open with a click so soft she barely heard it, even in the silence of the underground chamber. Helen stepped back as a section of the brick wall pivoted outward, creating an opening just wide enough for a person to slip through. 
It had been formed of the bricks themselves. The alternating blocks created a crenellated edge to the secret doorway. She felt the hair on her neck spike at the touch of cool air, damp and old and undisturbed. It had been built for illicit deliveries of whiskey back in the 20s, she'd been told, a clandestine tunnel leading all the way to Stockton Street. By the time she'd first seen it, it was a dead end. Now she was the only person alive who knew it existed. Soon it would be another lost bit of history. She switched the light back to her right hand and stepped through the opening. Three feet beyond was a wall, a deep niche the size of a small window hewn into the rock-studded cement. It looked like a crypt, a singular catacomb. But a crypt holds the remains of the dead. This, she thought, was a vault, its contents of inestimable value. Her light revealed a wooden crate slightly larger than a life magazine, two inches thick, covered in dust. Helen brushed it off, then slid her hands under the thin wood and lifted it. It was not heavy, just a bit ungainly. She held the mag light tight against one edge and stepped backwards into the room with the crockery. Oh, the cane definitely would have been a nuisance. She rested the edge of the crate on one of the shelves and stared into the vault for a long moment seeing something far beyond the stone. And she shook herself as if waking and reached behind the iron pot. Reversing the latch was easier. Another soft click and the doorway slowly slid closed for the last time, the jagged edges of its bricks fitting perfectly into the pattern of their stationary counterparts. An oversized shopping bag with paper handles lay folded on the shelf with the teacups. She slid the crate into it, lying it flat. Holding the bag like a tray, she walked back through the labyrinth of turns, moving much more slowly. With the last of her energy, she trudged up the stairs into the gloomy vestibule, leaving the door ajar. No longer anything of value down there. She stepped back out into Spofford Alley. Even at night, the narrow, dimly lit street seemed bright and expansive after the darkness of the cellars below. Helen laid the bag on the back seat of the waiting cab and locked the outside door of the building with a relieved sigh. Well, that was done. Handing the cabbie the promised 20, she got in. When they neared her building, she tapped on the plexiglass. Use the back entrance, please. The service elevator took her to the 12th floor, avoiding her doorman and any questions, and she let herself into the silent apartment. Setting the bag on her dresser, she went to the kitchen, erased the address from the whiteboard, and poured herself three fingers of the 18-year-old Macallan. Much more than her usual nightcap, Ivy would tisk and scold, but Ivy wasn't there. Helen took a screwdriver from a drawer and returned to the bedroom. Her drink was half gone before she felt ready. She laid a towel on her bed and gently withdrew the crate from the bag. The screws were old, set deeply into each side. The thin wood splintered as she removed them one by one. When the last screw lay on the towel, she used her fingers to carefully remove the lid. Inside lay a silk-wrapped rectangle nearly as large as the crate. She lifted it out and set it on the end of her bed, untying the cord that had secured the four corners of the fabric like the top of a circus tent. The silk slipped off onto the comforter, revealing the shallow glass-topped box within. Helen stared, then downed the last of her scotch in one long swallow. Hello, you, she said. It's been a while. Two. Tuesdays were always slow. Marty Blake had no idea why. He was behind the front counter catching up on paperwork, printing out mailing labels, updating the catalog and the database when he heard the jingle of the bell over the door. Foot traffic was better since he'd moved to his new location. Not that there hadn't been plenty of people on the streets of the Tenderloin, just not the clientele he wanted. Martin Blake Rare Books was a tiny shop and the rent was astronomical 
but it was only a few blocks from Union Square, so chances were excellent that any customers could afford whatever they fancied. He looked up to see an elderly Asian woman step softly inside. One hand gripped the head of an antique cane, the other held a large Neiman Marcus shopping bag. She wore black silk trousers and blouse under a cream jacket with lapels embroidered in a deep red that matched her lipstick. Well, this one had money, all right. On the far side of 80, he couldn't tell at a glance just how far, but her face was wizened and her hair was thin, still inky black, though, shot with a few strands of white. She wasn't stooped or hunched, and although the hand on the cane was spotted with age, her eyes were bright bits of jet behind thick, silver-rimmed glasses. He straightened his own jacket and ran a quick finger through his goatee as she approached. May I help you? Your specialty is 20th century ephemera. It was not a question. He shrugged. One of my areas of expertise. Are you looking for anything in particular? Perhaps. May I leave this here? She eased her bag onto a table. Be my guest. She nodded her thanks and Marty returned to his accounts. No need to keep a shoplifting eye out for this one. Fifteen minutes passed, punctuated only by the tappings of her cane on the hardwood floor and his fingers on the keyboard. Marty looked up occasionally, watching her peruse the shelves, trying to get an idea of what she was drawn to. Much of his business was online, and the bulk of his inventory was in storage. He only had room to display his most select pieces. In locked golden oak cases and shallow glass top tables, illuminated by tasteful halogen spots, were fewer than a hundred items. First editions, signed prints, and a few original manuscripts and drawings filled the front of the house. Some less respectable items, early paperbacks, erotica, some golden age comics, still rare and valuable, but not to everyone's taste, were in secure cabinets that lined the back wall. One held a dozen pulp magazines from the 20s and 30s, garish covers, lurid scenes of murder and torture, featuring scantily clad women with eyes like snake-filled pits, bound or chained and menaced by hunchback fiends, oriental villains, mad scientists. Every issue was in pristine condition. They'd been packed away in boxes for years, but in the last decade, the market had skyrocketed enough to justify the display space. The old lady had returned to the back wall twice now. The Agatha Christie map back, maybe? He didn't see her as a pulp fan. Those were usually geeky men buying up their fantasies with Silicon Valley startup money that had blossomed into stock options. Finally, she turned and pointed. May I see this one? Damn, really? You never knew in this business. It was a pulp and the best one of the lot, but the last thing he'd have thought she'd like, a 1936 weird menace whose cover was legendary for its grotesquerie. He kept the surprise out of his voice. Certainly. He unlocked the cabinet, removing the case tray, and set it on a nearby table. He adjusted a rheostat, and a halogen circle brightened for close inspection. She sat, leaning her cane against the side of the chair, and gazed at the magazine in front of her with an expression Marty couldn't read. Reverence? Longing? A bit of excitement, but mixed with what? She looked almost homesick. He sat down across from her. Tell me about this, she said. Well, as you can see, it's in superb condition. White pages, crisp spine, as if it were fresh off the newsstand. He slid a hand beneath the mylar sleeve and tilted the magazine slightly. It's an excellent issue, stories by both Clark Ashton Smith and Manly Wade Wellman, which alone makes it quite collectible since she held up a hand. I have no interest in those stories, she said. What about that cover? It was a violent scene with a dark, abstract background. The subject was a pale woman, her eyes wide with fear, naked except for a wisp of nearly flesh-toned silk, a nest of green-scaled vipers coiled around her feet. Looming over her, 
a leering hooded figure in scarlet brandished a whip. It was a terrifying erotic illustration, one that left nothing and at the same time, everything to the viewer's imagination. Ah, the art. Marty smoothly changed his sales pitch. The artist is, of course, Haskell. The signature's at the bottom right there. He pointed to an angular H, the crossbar, a rising slash with Haskell underneath. He did close to 100 covers, not just for Weird Menace, but for several of the other, he groped for the word, unconventional magazines. A lot of output for just a short career, seven years. No one really knows why he stopped. He thought back to the reference books in his office. His last cover was in 1940, October or November, I think. And nothing after that? Not a trace. It's like he disappeared off the face of the earth. Marty recalled conversations he'd had with other dealers over the years. There are rumors, he said slowly, that he did do one last cover, but it was never published. No one even knows what house it was for. I've heard guys at PulpCon sitting in the bar and talk about it like it was the holy grail, the piece, one piece, any collector would hawk his grandmother for. He stopped, remembering who he was talking to. Uh, no offense, ma'am. None taken. Now, what do you think happened? Uh, it was the war, probably. It might have been killed, but there's no service record. She nodded. My husband was a pilot. His plane was never found. Oh, well, I'm sorry. But see, for Haskell, there's, there's no paperwork of any kind other than a few invoices. No photos, either. He's a bit of a mystery. I see. And? She looked at him expectantly. Marty thought back to the few articles that had been published about Haskell. He worked almost exclusively in chalk pastels, not oils, which makes his paintings smoother and softer with an almost, oh God, what had that reviewer said? Uh, Marty drummed his fingers. Ah, yes, with an almost technicolor glow. His style is unmistakable and, and this is considered one of his finest covers. He lifted the magazine once more, this time placing it into the old woman's hands. The, the detail is exquisite. If you like that sort of thing, the woman arched an eyebrow. How much? Marty thought quickly. The catalog listing was 800, but he'd seen the look on her face. In this condition, 1200. Well, that seems reasonable, she said. Marty breathed a sigh of relief. Was she not even going to try and haggle? If not, it was going to be an excellent Tuesday after all. But I'm afraid my interest lies in the original artwork. The old woman returned the magazine to the tray case. Marty sputtered, then coughed in surprise. <laughs> An original Haskell? Almost impossible, he shook his head. I've only seen one at an exhibition. There are five, maybe six known to exist. Well, you claimed there were nearly a hundred covers, the woman said in an imperious, indignant tone. Oh, well, that's what he painted, yes, but Marty produced a handkerchief and wiped his dampening forehead. You see, back then the pulp market was, it was the lowest of the low. As soon as the magazine was on the stands, the art was destroyed. It had no value to anyone, including the artists. Besides, chalk pastels aren't as sturdy as oil paint, delicate as a butterfly wing. There are originals for sale? Mm, not often. They're all in private collections. The last one that came up in auction was five years ago, and it went for $60,000. One might go for double that now. Really? She tapped a finger to her lips, thinking, and then smiled with an expression so expansive it pleated her entire face. I'll just fetch my shopping bag, young man. I believe I have something that will interest you. And I will stop there. Thank you. Excellent.
Mara, you're muted. Still muted. Unmute yourself. There you go. That was great. Now we can hear. <laughs> <laughs> that was terrific. Yes. Thank you very much. And and it goes on from there. It's a novella. So right. I know. I I've read it. Yes, I know. It's <laughs> so yes. So anyway, yes, cool. So we will take some questions, but we have some questions to start. Well, I don't know if the audience has questions. Um, I'll ask a question first, okay? Let's see. Um, Mari, do you consciously structure your writing to be read aloud? <coughs> no. <coughs> you don't? Because it, you, it sounds really, you're a good read. I'm sorry. <coughs> Um, it's it's not conscious, but I do read uh, most of my stuff out loud. Well, specifically, I read it to a cat um, because that's how I catch mistakes. Uh, so then I think I end up uh, restructuring it a little bit as I read it out loud uh, and catch mistakes and think, okay, this will sound a little bit better this way. But I don't specifically start off thinking, okay, I'm going to have this be read aloud. Mm -hmm. Ellen, do you read yours? I mean, you know, specifically. Um, I, have, I have written one story. Um, it's called Echoes of Aurora, and I wrote it specifically to be read aloud because I was uh, a guest of honor at a con, and I wrote an original story to be read. Um, but mostly, I do the same thing. I, I finish the story, and I read it aloud, and I find the places that clunk, um, mm -hmm. and then I recast it so that it feels better as I'm reading aloud. But the other thing is, when I was reading Passing Strange, what I was reading was not what was on the page every time. There were words that read really well on the page in one order, and and I will shift them around when I'm reading as I'm getting to them because it, it works better with my voice. Um, or I will put in dialogue tags that aren't there in the text because it, it feels integral to to reading it, um, if you're listening, it, it seems to make more sense. So it, it's it's slightly fluid. Well, do you do that in, in advance or as you're actually reading it? No, I do it as I'm reading it. And I have had people in the audience be following along and one guy just like looked up and was like, that's, it, <laughs> that's not what you, and, and it's like, no, it's, you know, it's a, a performance is different than, than reading text on a page. And, yeah. And you also have to go with how your voice is that day. And at some point there are sentences that are perfectly lovely sentences on the page and I run out of breath two thirds of the way through them. And so I either put in a pause that isn't really there in the punctuation on the page or I add a word and make it two sentences and, and give myself a break. So no, I do it on the fly. Okay, wow. It's impressive. Well, I'm not. I'm never aware that I'm. I don't plan it, and I'm not really aware that I'm going to do it. I just I find myself doing it and thinking, if anybody is following along, they're going to be going. But but that's not what you wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and but mostly mostly people just listen, and and if they go back and and read it and realize that two words were flopped, good for them. They are very careful readers. It's also when you read things out loud, um, it becomes easier to know what stories can be read during a reading. Uh, like you'll notice everything I read tonight was published before this year. And that's because a couple of the things I published this year, when I read them out loud, I realized this is not going to work very well in a reading. Uh, it's working as a story, but mm -hmm. uh, like my story in, in Apex from this year, would have been a little tricky to read out loud and my tweeting story also would have been really tricky to read out loud i'm not sure how i could have done that so mm -hmm. that also is something that i at least discover when i'm reading the stories out loud so that i'll know okay can i actually read this at an upcoming event there's another section of passing strange that i <laughs> the first time i read it aloud i realized that not only are there four songs um but there are probably 42 different character voices mm -hmm. and and yeah if i'm if i'm up for it it's fabulous to read aloud it's really really fun and if my energy level is not quite up for 
singing and 42 different characters, then I pick something else. Right. Yeah, and I've, I've also tended to do a lot of very experimental fiction that doesn't necessarily, again, work very well when it's read. But that said, when I'm reading it to myself or to the cats, it's like, oh, this is this is a place where I made a mistake. This is where I used the wrong word. This is, you know, so there's things you can still pick up when I'm reading them out loud. It's just it won't work that well in performance. Do your cats get alarmed when it's something like, halt, said the guard, and the cat's like, what? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that also gives me a good sense of uh, reaction. The, the two current cats have only been with me for a year, and they aren't quite into this getting read to mode yet. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, mate, we'll, we'll work on this. They're, they're like, what are we supposed to be doing here? Do we run? And yes, occasionally they do flee for under the bed. So it's well, that's the hardest cool. thing for me about reading on on this kind of platform is there's no audience reaction. Yeah. And so I have no idea how it's going or or you know the lines that are dramatic, you mm -hmm. don't get anybody going <gasps> and the lines that are funny, you don't get any laughs. And so <laughs> It's it's very weird to be, it, it feels like I'm reading badly uh, because I'm not getting the audience reaction that I'm used to getting if I'm reading it live. Well, to assure you, you both read really well. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> you both read terrific. Yeah. People even said so in the comments. So. Huh? What? The, really? The, I, yeah. if, if you look at the comment, like the there was a comment about the seer's voice in in Mari's reading. Oh, and yeah. A lot of. Uh, applause, so yeah, people appreciate it. Carol, have, I'm sorry, go on. Um, I have a question, if I can ask it. Um, so I, I was, so this is more about influences. So what, what, uh, for you guys, both of you, um, kind of when you were younger, do you feel had influence on your writing, which could be books, movies, whatever, and kind of storytelling. So we was doing that. I think for me it was um, the fact that we moved a lot when I was a kid. Uh, so I needed to find something uh, as I went from place to place to place. I, I wasn't very good at making new friends. Um, and so I found myself lost in books, but also when you move a lot, uh, particularly when you move back and forth from Europe to the United States, um, you, it's hard, it's a little hard to describe, but, um, you become in some ways more of an observer of a community that you move to, uh, rather than a member of it. And that gives you a different way of structuring stories and you start looking for stories. So I would say moving around a lot was probably the biggest influence I had. So, and then books and then Star Wars. So, you know, kind of in that. <laughs> Star Wars was very big. That was a good place for me to make friends because we could always, you know, play with uh, lightsabers or whatever. It's interesting. We we never moved. My father bought the house I grew up in in 1951 and died in 2008. So he was there for 57 years. So nothing in my life ever changed. Um, and so I think I and so I think I had kind of the opposite thing. I knew everything about my house and my neighborhood in so much intricate detail because because it never changed. Um, and that was that I think informs a lot of of detail that I put put in my fiction of stuff that I remember, like the texture of the basement door. Um, because there was only one basement door because it was the same house. Um, but in terms of, of in terms of reading, um, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle and Roald Dahl, uh, <coughs> which are two very different influences. Um, and in terms of like TV, uh, Twilight Zone. Um, it, it is so hard to write a really good Twilight Zone story because it, you either see the ending coming from a mile away or it's the kind of twist that you go, oh, it's a cookbook, yeah. <laughs> um, which you can get away with the first time, but you can't. So all through like junior high and high school, I was writing that kind of story that had like really clever twist endings. Um, 
And then I guess I got it out of my system because now I write stories. I write the stories that I absolutely hated in high school that had ambiguous endings. And the teacher would say, well, what do you think happened? It's like, I don't, what, why don't they tell us what happened? This story didn't even end. And now I wrote the, write those. So. Yeah, I, I think um, because we moved around, well, when I was uh, very small, my mom it was not very big on television, to put it mildly, so I wasn't allowed to watch it uh, unless I went to somebody else's, unless I'd been really, really good, but usually it was having to sneak over to someone else's house to watch TV. Uh, and then when we were in Italy, there was just not much point to trying to watch uh, what at the state of American television at the time or any television at the time in Italy. Um, it has significantly improved now. Italian, Italian television is booming. But when I was there, it was Italian film. They didn't do television. They did film. And the film was not considered appropriate for my age. <laughs> so uh, I was... Antonio. Yeah, I, that, that was not something that my parents felt I should be. We I did see some uh, inappropriate for my age films anyway, but um, mostly in English. Um, so... Yeah, I ended up more in books because I didn't do a lot of television um, and I didn't have those satisfying endings. Um, and when I really started watching more TV, it had become it had gone into a much more serialized format. So like the TV I'm watching now, I'm noticing is very much the I'm sure you keep coming back to it. You know, there's a little cliffhanger. There's a little whatever. And there's um, like and. Even in uh, some of the late 80s stuff, the uh, sitcoms and stuff, there was very much of a continuing story rather mm -hmm. than a, okay, this is a self-enclosed um, episode. So mm -hmm. I don't know how much that's influenced my writing. But <coughs> it's something I've definitely noticed. Mm -hmm. What made you write Passing Strange, Ellen? I started writing Passing Strange when I was 23. Uh, it was 1970, no, it was 22. It was 1976, and I had moved to San Francisco, and I was I was in love with the city, and, and I had just come out and figured out that I was queer, and it, it, San Francisco had so much history. I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, which has a lot of history, but it's all like, pioneers and i have always thought pioneers were just the most boring thing ever um and really i mean if you grow up with with a state i mean ohio became a state in 1803 so all of the stuff that we got in elementary school and junior high and high school was boring old white men um and san francisco had this really lush 19th century and 20th century history, and it was mostly still here. Um, and so I wrote, I think I wrote four scenes of the story, same characters. I, it, I think one sentence of the four scenes that I wrote when I was 23 survived into Passing Strange. Um, Did you have the same title at the time? Did you have no. No, I had, I had, I had, didn't. I think it was, um, what was I calling it? Um, there is a file in on my laptop that that it's called something like oh it was called the thirty nine fair I think um, it which is the file in my laptop but but I mean it was typed first um, and then every when I got a computer I keyed it in and then every time I got a new computer I would move the file over and every once in a while I would open up the files and read them and go huh I should do something with that sometime. Um, and when the, the impetus to do it in 2015 was that Jonathan Strand said, I'm doing novellas for Tor.com, you want to write one? Um, and I thought, sure, fine, what? Um, and I thought, I wonder if I can go back, I wonder if I can re resurrect these four scenes that I have. And the answer to that was pretty much no, because I had written them when I was a baby. Um, but I had files of research that I had done literally 40 years before um, and just continued with that. And one of the things that I did, especially for the, that first scene in the cellar, 
I read all of Dashiell Hammett's Continental Op stories because they're set in San Francisco in, in the late 20s and early 30s. So they're about 10 years earlier, but the feel for it and and his Chinatown stories, and there's all of these things, you know, secret passageways and 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 hidden hidden staircases and all. And so I read I read all of those over about six weeks. I would go out to dinner and I would read. I had the big one of those big compilation Dashiell Hammett collections, um, and I would read like one or two stories with a burger, um, and just sort of let them settle. Um, and I had a friend who had an entire wall of old pulps. And so I spent an afternoon just picking them at random and looking at the covers. And and at one point I had, I was reading, I tried to read Lovecraft and couldn't, um, but I started making a list of adjectives that are were Lovecraftian adjectives. And I ended up with four pages of pulp adjectives and I thought I will write this entire thing in that style and decided that that was a bad idea. Um, but the last chapter, the last chapter, I think I used 45 pulp adjectives in three pages. So if you haven't read it yet, you have that to look forward to. <laughs> but I read, I mean, I did probably two or three months of research before I even started. And at one point I had I had Google Maps open with the 3D view of what you would do if you were sitting in a particular place in North Beach and looking out over the bay. Um, I mean, I I live two miles from there, so. Um, and I had a bunch of pictures of the 1939 World's Fair and what it looked like at night in pa on paper sitting there. And I had something else open. And I was doing this Vulcan mind meld of this is what Google Maps will show me in the 3D view, and this is what it actually looked like 75 years ago, and this is this other stuff that I know, and how can I pull that all together and describe it on the page so you feel like you're there, not like you're reading about it. Right. Um, and that was just enormous fun. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a question. <clears throat> For both of you, do you listen to music when you write? And if so, what kind? Um, this this uh, comes and goes. I can't listen to any music that has lyrics in it while I'm writing because the lyrics and the words will get into what I'm writing and I'll get totally distracted and it'll get messed up. Um, but I do find that if I'm stuck on something or if I'm really struggling, listening to music from movies, uh, specifically action movies, tends to work surprisingly well so just listening to that soundtrack um so that yeah i don't do it all the time but i do listen to uh quite a few i like the um pride and prejudice soundtrack uh from the most recent pride and prejudice movie um i like the star trek soundtracks which is seems like it would be odd but for writing fantasy too i don't do science fiction to the star trek soundtracks which feels <laughs> feels somehow wrong but um i will listen to those and yeah mm -hmm. what about you ellen i don't um, <coughs> i i kind of i kind of aspire to be the sort of person that listens to music while they write but i i don't um i have the same problem that mari does that if there are words in the music it makes kind of a moray pattern uh, a distraction pattern of the words I'm trying to write and the words I'm listening to and I and my head explodes. Um, I listen, I do have soundtracks for, for most long works of, because I write things that are mostly set in historical periods, I will do soundtracks on on my phone of things that, that my characters would be listening to to sort of get me in the mood, but I don't do them while I'm actually writing. Um, I did, for Passing Strange, watch a lot of, I wa watched a bunch of movies set in San Francisco in the 40s, or made in San Francisco in the 40s. And because my two main characters in my head have the voices of a very young Katherine Hepburn and a very young um, Lauren Bacall, I watched movies of both of those actresses so that I could get the pacing of the dialogue down and there's one scene that I absolutely love that I could never ever read aloud because it would involve 
going back and forth in a dialogue between Katharine Hepburn and Lauren Bacall, mm -hmm. which my vocally, I, I can do one or two sentences, but I can't carry on the whole dialogue. But, but it, if, if you, uh, in, it works, it works in my head. I just can't, can't do it as a performance. Um, Raj, what about you? Do you write to music? Uh, I have ADHD, so I write to music, I write to television shows, I write to like all kinds of things depending on what's going on. So, um, but I, it depends because sometimes the, the words are a problem. Like something you've heard 50 times before maybe like might be okay because it sort of blends into the background. But, um, but yeah, it, for me it depends. But I sometimes do need some kind of stimulation happening while I'm writing just to kind of mm -hmm. give me the peace to do that, so. Mm -hmm. Do you have questions for each other? Ellen Amari, do you want to ask anything of the other? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know there would be homework. Um, <laughs> no, there isn't, you don't have to, it's just if, it, you, know, if, you, if you just have <coughs> something you'd like to ask um, no because actually most of the questions i've ever i've ever wanted to know we've had in conversations around the pool at ICVA. so mm -hmm. um i'm sure there are mysteries that i don't know but i don't know what they are no i think i think we should put the audience on this on on the spot and 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 have have a question appear in the comments section like any minute now yeah, come on, Joseph, ask a question, get a question together. Joseph says, amazing that a story started so long ago can inspire a final story to emerge. Talking about yours. It, it really, it, it, it's funny because my 23 year old self, I'm not sure how much she would like this story because it changed so very much from what I would have written when I was 23. And and that story, because I have overwritten my my mental hard drive, that story will never get written. Um, yes, there's a question there. Actually, well, it's not exactly a question. Can you? How do you? You, Raj, you have to hit it. And it'll oh, come to show it. Yeah, I think. Yeah. So, what's the question, Joseph? <laughs> oh, I'm talking about the one that John that Jonathan asked you to write it. Hold on. Ah. I, I almost always write to market. Um, when I was starting out, I wrote, actually, no, no, I, my first story I, I sold because I knew an editor who was doing an anthology of something I, I thought I could come up with an idea for. So no, I'm a, I'm a AMA, not the poster child for for any kind of writing process. Um, but you sent me a cup, didn't I publish stories in sci fiction? Is that where I published your stories? And they were not, I mean, you might've written them with me in mind, but. No, I wrote, I wrote that one um, as, as a, as a clarion exercise. Okay. So I, I frequently, I almost all, I mean, every once in a while I will get um, an idea that I just want to follow. Um, we'll call a springs. Andy and I, Andy and I wrote together. Um, and I just, it was an idea that was percolating for, uh, 10 years. Um, and yes, Gary, the first one was for Nicola Griffith for bending the landscape. Uh, it's called time gypsy. Um, and it is being reprinted in a new anthology, uh, that Jonathan Strand is putting out called Someone, someone in time, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, it's and I, I loved your, your um, you did this, the librarian story, which I really loved. The librarian story just came out, came out of, of, of did it come out of nowhere? Come out of what? I think it came out of nowhere, yeah. Um, so there are some stories that have just come out of nowhere, and then there are a lot more stories that it's like, I have promised somebody a story about Scotch tape and it's due the 1st of June and it's now the 1st of May. So I need to think really seriously about Scotch tape really fast. Um, and, and sometimes my best work comes out that way because I mean, I was like that in elementary school and junior high. It's like, I did not do my paper on Brazil until the night before it was due. 
no matter how many teachers and parents said, are you working on this? And I would lie and go, yes, yes, it's almost done, um, which is a really good tool for a writer when editors email you and go, how's the story coming going? It's going great. I haven't started it. Um, I, yeah, I work, I work best under pressure and deadline, although not in the last year. Um, yeah. Mari, because there's too much other weird pressures and deadlines. How about you? Have, do you write to market? Um, <laughs> I used to, and then I found that it was a real problem for me personally uh, because well, for one thing, if that market then said no, you were kind of, I was kind of stuck. <laughs> and I found that the stories I've had the hardest time selling uh, typically are the ones that were written for a market or for a specific theme. Every once in a while, something interesting will come up and I'll think, ooh, uh, that sounds like something I actually want to write about. Um, but in... <sighs> In general, if I'm trying to write for a specific market, it has not necessarily gone all that well for me. Uh, so I just have tried to back away from that and I've tried to focus on this is the story and then I will worry about what to do with it if and when the story is finished. Um, I don't know that that's always the best approach either, but it's at least a little less anxiety inducing. Um, and I mean, the other thing is unlike Ellen, I don't get all that many requests for, you know, please do this for this specific market. Um, so that does give me a little bit more freedom to say, okay, I will go ahead and, you know, do this. So Ellen, are you saying that you, you need someone to kind of solicit or commission a story you won't write? I mean, um, in general? Yeah, most days. Um, I, I am I, once again, I'm not the poster child for this. Um, I mean, I will I will scribble down bits of ideas and sometimes they will go someplace. But but no, I'm lazy. Um, and and I, I've been writing the last year. I've been writing a bunch of nonfiction. I've been writing a memoir, um, which it's weird because you know the pandemic. I've been home alone with a cat for a year and a half now, <clears throat> and I could have written three or four novels, um, but I have not. Um, I find that being, I mean, it, it, being a writer is a weird thing because you are alone with your imaginary friends and your own ideas and everything a lot of the time. But then there's a break and you go out and you see people and you have dinner with people and and somebody says something and you go, oh, oh yes. What if his brother was a plumber? And and then you, you know, scribble a note on a napkin. And for the last year and a half, that part hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. And so I've been feeling like the well is dry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and yeah. And I'm hoping that it won't always be dry. Um, but I tried to write a story that I had. I had promised. I had promised to somebody who will remain nameless. Um, and sat down and tried to do it. And about seventy-five percent of the time, when I sat down and tried to work on it, I had a little baby panic attack. I would just, I would get sick to my stomach. I would have a headache. I would, it was physically really unpleasant to try to do this. And I finally emailed the editor and said, I'm, I am, this is the first time in my professional career that I've done this, but I can't make this deadline because I could probably finish the story in time, but it would be a terrible story because I can't, I can't do the deep dive that I need to do. And I don't know why, but it's making me, um, really antsy and angsty and and so for my own health because this has been a really weird year I'm just going to let myself back off um, and was it do you think it was the story or the circumstances I have no idea I really don't know I have not I have not I mean physically it's weird to think of writing as a physical thing but I mean Mari you're aware of this you know you, if you are for the most part sitting down 
So your back is in a particular position mm -hmm. and your hips are in a posi particular position and you are looking down. So I, I have a bad, I have arthritis in my neck. So sometimes that is really difficult. So sometimes just sitting and doing it is physically somewhere between uncomfortable and painful. Um, but in the last year, mentally, it's just been a weird space. And I'm, I, I have been following people on Facebook and other places, and I know I'm not alone in this. Um, and so like right now, I'm, I'm playing with paint. I'm just making colors, and I'm not trying to, to do anything linear or verbal or anything. I'm just, I'm trying to find that creative fun I want to I want to play with words and stuff, but I'm trying to come at it from a completely different perspective because otherwise I feel like I'm beating my head against a wall. Um, and there are some writers that have just, you know, because they've been locked in their houses, have hit a, an incredibly creative spurt, and they've written you know four novellas in six months and. And then there's other of us who feel like we're just like sitting there going, duh, 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 duh. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is I'm not, I have not seen other humans in person, except for, you know, a handful of people that I know in San Francisco and like the clerk at the grocery store who I've gotten very friendly with um, and, you know, my doctor and my dentist. Other than that, it's, it's one of these things which feels like, playing Hollywood squares um, or, or I'm by myself with a cat and I really miss the kind of contact that you get in a bar where you're just talking and all of a sudden somebody brings up Robin Hood and somebody else talks about having a pair of green shoes and the conversation just goes over there and it's the stuff you can't plan for and it's the stuff I miss. <coughs> Yeah, Joseph talks about that. Can you see what he said? Can Raj? Can you? I'll put it on. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I found for the first time I was working on a new, um, an anthology this year, a new one, <clears throat> and for the first time ever, at least five people were like totally late. I mean, really late. You know, people who I usually can rely on. I mean, eventually, most of them actually eventually got their stories in. And I, you know, I was pushing them, but I, I also realized, yes, it's a circumstance, but I need to get this goddamn book in. <clears throat> you know, I need these stories now. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I can see that it affects some writers a lot and some it doesn't affect at all. And I'm not a writer, but I, I realize I shouldn't, maybe say this, but it hasn't affected me at all. I mean, my life is not that different. I was not traveling, and that's it. I mean, I was going out to eat in the middle of the winter outside with friends, and I liked being outside in the winter. I didn't care about eating out, out. I mean, the first few months I was totally, you know, I wasn't doing that, but eventually, but I started going out with friends. And, um, and I just don't feel isolated. I mean, I, I well, the thing is, I can, I can I can edit. Mm -hmm. If I got if I if I had started the pandemic with something that I was already in the middle of, mm -hmm. I think I would have been able to finish it, and I and I think I would have been able to edit it. It's it's the the that weird awesome. creative burst that starts something and gets it going. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I don't need that as an editor. What I do need is focus. Yeah, and at times. I, for uh, some bits of time, I wasn't able to focus, um, but mostly I was able to do that for whatever reason. Maybe because, it, although it may not seem so, I'm a loner at heart, you know, and I, I like being alone. <clears throat> but I also have been meeting with friends every, I mean, a lot of friends I was meeting every few weeks online. You, I know you say you don't like that, that or it doesn't work for you, Ellen. But for me, Skyping and doing Facebook Messenger, <clears throat> and even Zoom. I don't, Zoom is a little more official kind of in some weird way, but I love it. I mean, I've been seeing friends who I don't see, people from all over the world I've, I had virtual dates with, and I have a regular one with Pat Cadigan and Carolyn Oakley on Mondays. 
Um, they're both in England. And, you know, I would talk to Karen Warren in Australia and meet her and Linda Addison and Isabel Wilson in San Francisco and uh, John Langan and Nathan Ballingrum and Jeff Ford. <clears throat> I mean, that's my social life or more. I mean, now I am going out a bit more with friends here outside still. But I have managed to create a social life that satisfa that's satisfactory, that's been satisfactory for the last year and a half or however long, for whatever reason. I think my problem with it is is it's it's satisfactory in, in, in the I have caught up with people and what they are doing, but I still haven't left my kitchen or my office. And you take and, walks at all? I mean, do you go out at all? Yeah, I, I, I go. I go for like two walks a day. I go for one in the late morning and one in the evening. And I have and I go out to eat a couple of times. And but so I get out of the house. But I look forward. But but seeing somebody on Zoom feels almost exactly like watching TV. A little more interactive. Mm -hmm. But but you know, for for the last at least a year of the last year and a half, I was just watching way too much TV. Um, and and I was looking forward to it ending and actually having, you know, human interaction and somebody going, let's Zoom just feels like more TV. Mm -hmm. Because this <laughs> isn't really I mean, I'm sitting I'm sitting at a desk. I have not, I have not put on human pants. I'm wearing my sweatpants. Um, you know, I haven't, I, I haven't left, left my house. And, and once it's over, I'm not coming back home from somewhere. And there's something about actually leaving the space and going someplace else and talking to people and then coming back that I find energizing that I'm not getting. And yes, little mini ICFA, it will be my first trip in almost two years. Oh, you On the other hand, in, in 2019, I did 14 trips in 10 months. So the pandemic is my fault because I got home from the 14th trip and thought, I am never going to an airport again. I never want to travel. I'm just going to put my feet up. And I told myself I would take three months off and just veg. And at the end of that three months was when the lockdown started. So it was that the timing was just <laughs> bad for me. But mm -hmm. no, 2019, I was busier than hell. Mm -hmm. And I was traveling and I was seeing people and I was exhausted. And so, yeah, there needs to be a balance. But but I, I don't feel like I'm balanced right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, don't forget, I moved in the middle of the pandemic, but that was okay. <laughs> and I love my new neighborhood, so. And I have, a, and now I have someone who lives near me, who you know, who I'm friends with, who lives in Stuyvesant Town, also who I hang out with. <clears throat> How far are you from where you used to live? Totally across town. Instead of the far west side, I'm on the far east side now. I'm on like the equivalent of Avenue B and 16th Street. But I'm still, on that, still on that end of the I'm, island. I'm still on the 14th Street line. I'm still in the south part of the island, but I'm on the 14th Street line. I take the bus. I mean, I can go back and forth. I'm, I can go to my old neighborhood whenever I want, <clears throat> and it's easy. I mean, it's just the 14th Street bus or the subway, which I'm not taking. Um, but I'm discovering all these new restaurants and all these new things in my neighborhood now, and I'm getting people. Some A few people have visited me here. I mean, not staying overnight, but I mean, you know, like checking out the apartment and stuff. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> it's like a little mini community. It's an oasis in the middle of Manhattan. I mean, there's a huge oval. It's 80, 70 acres, I think, or 80 wow. acres. Yeah. I just looked it up with like 200 buildings or something weird like that. You know, um, it goes from 14th Street to 20th Street and uh, First Avenue to about Third Avenue. And so, so it's a little cottage in the woods. In it, <laughs> kind of. Let's say it's more like a gated community, although it's not gated. <laughs> you know, in the middle is this huge oval, and we can put we can there are Adirondack chairs in the middle of the oval, and there are tables all around and benches all around, and all different ages here. It's like I I lucked out. I mean, I'm not. It's not cheap, but I lucked out. I mean, I tried to get it through affordable housing, and it didn't work. <clears throat> Some 
paying more than you know than I was hoping. I'm paying a lot more than I was, but it's bigger and it's and I'm on the ninth floor. Um, and there's an elevator. Well, that's why I moved. I mean, that's what the, the whole impetus for moving at all was the elevator. Otherwise, I would have stayed in my old apartment forever. No. Sorry, looking at the oh hi Joseph moved also okay. Yeah. I am I am not a big time angler, but my father was. Mm -hmm. What is IGFA? I mean IGFA, International something of. International Game Fishing Association, I oh, think. Oh, is it? Oh, oh nice. Okay, cool. <laughs> yes, well, we actually go fishing for the alligator. <laughs> you know, someone once caught a snapping turtle, I think. <laughs> yeah. no. Well, Joseph, Gary, Lizanne, anyone have any more questions? While we're waiting for questions, um, I am not staying at the hotel during the mini ICFA event, but um, you know, feel free to contact me if you want to hang out, um, and I will try to make arrangements. So, since like Ellen, I really haven't hung out with people <laughs> uh, since right now it's July. Um, you know, and it, it's weird for me because I'm in Florida, and right now we really haven't shut down. Everything's normal, but all the fun stuff has ended, and that for me is kind of the problem. It's not, um, it, it's, I mean, I don't, I, you know, we certainly, every, everything's open, um, but in terms of getting together and hanging out with friends and, you know, doing some art classes and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that's not really happening. Doing Disney, really not happening, you know, anything like that, so. Right. Um, well, Joseph, I've seen this question. Um, I honestly kind of stopped writing in 2016, so no, <laughs> I've been struggling for, for some time to finish writing. Um, I will say that in 2000, I ended up doing some more Flash, and I wrote some COVID stories, uh, both of which sold and were published, so that I was worried largely because when we're talking about writing on theme, um, I was like, great two COVID stories, they're not going to sell. <laughs> Nobody wants to read about COVID right now. Uh, and luckily for me, they, they, they did. Um, but for me, there's a lot of other issues that go on with writing that are non COVID related, including, you know, the fact that, um, I don't know if you can tell, but this is a wheelchair. I have a chronic illness that comes and go well, two chronic illnesses. So that's been more of my, uh, problem more so than COVID and, um, what have you. Um, isolation has not been great for me mentally. Uh, and I have really missed seeing people, but um, I would say my writing more took a dive in 2016, possibly even before that. When is the mini ICFA? October? Uh, two weeks from, from tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not even sure I'm going to regular ICFA next year. We'll see if I have time. Um, I will be at the regular ICFA. Um, I will say that for anybody interested in doing hotel reservations for that, apparently it's not really set up with ICFA because I was transferring my hotel nights over to March. Um, and that got very confusing with the Marriott reservation people. <laughs> so uh, that's my little bit of warning, but I will should be at the March event. Mm -hmm. Gary, are you going to World, uh, to World Fantasy? Are you going to be in Montreal? It takes a while for him to type. You know, I mean, I'm going to go to World like, Con Ed. No. Just like talking to people on Mars. It's <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. three um, minutes. I should, I should be at World Con in DC. I mean, I have the hotel room. I have my um, everything. I have my American Airlines ticket. So, assuming that works out and American doesn't cancel flights on me, you know, I should be there. Uh, Keep fingers crossed. World fantasy, not so much. Um, no, because well, the problem with world fantasy is that I you do need to get that seventy-two hour um, yes. COVID test, and our local COVID test place is not doing a great job of getting results back in seventy-two hours. <laughs> this is not personally <laughs> me. Apparently, uh, Air Canada will accept the home tests that you can buy online. That you can do at home and there's a uh, some sort of web interface 
um, and they will accept the results from that. Because my problem is I'm going to Montreal, but I will be in the hotel for, for four and a half days. And in order to get on the plane coming home, I have to have a negative COVID test within 72 hours, which means I have to take a COVID test while I'm in the hotel. Okay. Like, well, pretty much the day after I get there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I but. Had, I but had the it, same thing where I was going to, but I was actually less concerned about getting a, rap, a rapid test in Montreal because I figured, hey, it's Montreal. They, they have tests. The problem here is. Um, there is a place I can actually get to in via my manual wheelchair if I really try for it, but I can make it there on mobility scooter on my trike without too many problems, but it is not kept up with the speed <laughs> of testing. And I know the people across the street were like, okay, it has definitely been more than 72 hours. They weren't, tr they were trying to make school decisions. Um, not, uh, and mm -hmm. they were like, uh, we actually need an answer to this. So I am a little concerned about you know, trying to rely on them. And there are other places, but uh, it's kind of expensive to get the 24 hour guarantee. Yeah. So I thought, eh, you know, I will get to Canada at some point. I would love to see Montreal when I am not there because I'm a college student looking for a place that where you can drink where you're, even though you aren't 21. <laughs> I'd love to know what Montreal is like under those circumstances. <laughs> uh, so, you know, at some point, um, and certainly I will try to be back at a world fantasy book. Okay. Yeah, assuming okay. that that the U.S. Canadian border is still permeable in mm -hmm. the beginning of November, I'm going to World Fantasy. But but that's a big if. Well, I just got my flight, so. <clears throat> and it's United, but Air Canada is flying it. So. Yeah, I've got I've got a hotel membership, and I've got and I've got a room and a roommate. I I haven't pull the trigger on the flight yet, but I'll do that this week. Okay. Oh, so, oh and Joseph says he drove from New York to Florida recently. Where in Florida did you go, Joseph? It'll take him a while. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I went to, usually when I, in March, when I would go to if I would drive from, uh, with Kathy Goonan from my mom's to Orlando, uh, to Orlando, you know, and I, because she's gone. I mean, I sometimes took the bus, which I really hate. <clears throat> but if I do come to go to ICFA in March, I'll probably just do a different trip to my mom's and not do both, not combine them. Yeah. My mom's West Palm. It's just easier to do two different trips. Well, we do. Are, we are finally, it looks like we are finally actually getting the train that from running from uh, Miami to the Orlando area. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that will make things a lot easier and it should stop off at West Palm Beach. Um, oh, that's interesting. Okay. But where does it go in, in Orlando? Where it's going to the airport and it's going to Disney Springs. Okay. Uh, so uh, the airport at least would be convenient for ICFA. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, that's possible too. I'll have to say, I don't know Titusville. Uh, it's about an hour from Orlando, a little less, depending upon how fast you decide to drive it. It's on so, the coast, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it would be nice if we had the train going back and forth from Titusville to Orlando regularly, but I don't think we have that yet. This is, mm -hmm. but we'll see. Okay. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I, I don't know if there, I don't think there are. Get them in quick. Huh? What? I was saying get them in quick. Yeah, get them yeah, in my quick. My auctioneer thing is going, all right, questions. You got questions? You got, you got two seconds. Okay, one second and questions going, going, gone. We're going. We're going to go. All right. We'll be there. Hmm? <laughs> And nobody is nobody seems to be jumping in with burning questions. So well, thank you so much. You both were great. It was wonderful seeing you. Thank you. Oh, thank okay. you for, for thank inviting you me. Thank you for having me. This was great. Oh, thank you're you. You're very welcome. Great. And thank you, Raj, for keeping everything on going correctly. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad we solved the, the echo yeah, problem. Yes, that was scary. So okay. Ellen, Ellen, you owe us dinner. Yeah. yeah, I will owe you dinner. Matt and I will owe you dinner at some point, but yeah. But you will be getting a stipend from Matt. He'll be sending it by PayPal. So, 
Great. Well, thank you all. Thank you. And uh, Thanks, see you everybody. next. Hopefully, some people will show up next month, like Lizanne and Carol, who's gone. Hopefully, they'll come in person. We can hope. Yeah, I won't be there in person. It's it's a bit far, and, and I'll be going to Montreal, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. So. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Well, I guess you turn off the recording. Do you know how to do that, Raj? Right. Yep, I, I can do that. All Good right. night, everybody. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.